Hi again, it's Jason from Fraser Valley Rose Farm, and I have to say, you've been an excellent audience. Every time I've done one of these tours of a horticulture facility, a grower, or something inside to the industry, you guys have enjoyed that information and said so in the comments. Today, you're in for a real treat. I went for a tour of Clearview Horticulture. It's one of North America's premier suppliers of clematis and other ornamental vines. They grow a lot of other stuff too, but I'll leave that to the guide of this tour, Rob Ween, to explain. What you're seeing in these greenhouses today is, is what we call finished product, and what we mean by that is it's ready for retail. But um, a big part of our um, business is actually propagation. So propagation, what we new plants are going to other growers is a big part of our business. We call those liners. So um, we'll ship to you know some of the smallest mom and pop operations all over. Uh, the United States and Canada and, and actually even sometimes into Europe or or China or Japan or even uh, even got a little bit going into Australia um, just little little plots that, that customers will grow or that our grower customers will grow on as wow. finished plants for their retailers that's incredible yeah now I'm gonna put you on the spot here and it's okay I'll take it out if you don't uh, yeah. if you don't have the number at the top of your head but Rough number of propagated plants or propagated clematis per year. Okay. <laughs> we, we end up having a rooted product of about 3.5 million plants a year. So how do we accomplish that? Um, almost all the propagation is done in spring and early summer. In order to meet those needs, we are literally sticking 70,000 cuttings every day. Yeah. So right now we have um, 150, actually 160 people uh, on staff and we're, right now we're working six days a week trying to keep up with lots of overtime. We produce about 200 varieties of clematis and um, we bring varieties from all over the world. But on top of that, we have um, uh, our, our own breeding that goes on here at Clearview. So what we mean by that is it's, it's a hybrid, hybridizing. So what we'll do is we'll take two varieties that we really like, um, we'll get them to bloom, we'll do um, a cross pollination with the blooms and then we'll harvest the seeds later. And then um, we'll grow on, evaluate the varieties, see if we like them. And for probably every 50 varieties, there's only one that meets the criteria. And it takes probably close to 10 years to get a variety into production. Wow, which sounds is, like a, a crazy long process. It I know is, it with is. rose breeding, like David Austin does yeah. a similar thing and they talk about how many thousands of varieties they go through yeah. to get one good one for market. Yeah, yeah, it, it's, uh, it, it's gotta meet so many different criteria. I mean, for starters, it's gotta be different than, than anything else. So there's no point in even moving forward. Um, it's gotta uh, be disease resistant, resistant. it's gotta bloom well. And then finally, it's got to propagate well because you can have the, uh, the nice characteristics, but then if the growers can't produce it, it's, it's of no value. And then the final thing is garden performance. Right. So after we've got all these other things figured out, then we have to make sure that it's actually going to perform well in the garden because just because it's got a nice bloom doesn't necessarily mean it's something that should go to market because it's got to got to do really well in the garden. Makes sense and I guess hardiness testing isn't so much a thing in clematis because they're fairly hardy or do you do some trials on that as well? That's a really good question. I mean if you know what you're breeding from um, the hardiness has a, a tendency to follow in that line so if you're breeding two really hardy varieties you know the the, uh, the new variety is going to be hardy as well. However if you take a really hardy variety and cross it with um, a tender variety like say um, for example, if you took something like Jacqueminae and, and crossed it with Florida Cibolde, then you don't, Florida Cibolde being tender, Jacqueminae being hardy, you don't know. Right. And then you do have to do the trialing on hardiness as well. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. That, you are stuffed. Oh. This is fantastic. This is the tip of the iceberg. <laughs> this is the tip of the iceberg. Um, right now we have, uh, in, just in the one gallon size, we have um, about 250,000 pots on the ground getting ready to go out. And we are shipping heavily now. So you'll see, you'll see some, some spots that are empty. Um, but uh, at the same time, we have other crops coming in. So um, 
yeah, it's it's a juggling process. Now, I think I've seen your products in independent garden centers for sure, yes. but also in some of the larger stores as well, big box and distribution like that. Yes, right? our product literally goes everywhere, and um, we, we love the independent garden centers. They do a fantastic job of looking after their customers, and uh, they get uh, some really a little bit different labeling than the, than the chains and they also get the opportunity to go ahead and and say I want five of this and five of this and five of this and five of this because they know what their customers right. need um, whereas with the chains um, they also get excellent product um, but they don't get quite the same uh, variety selection and and they're not expected to have quite the same level of knowledge at store level Right. to give that consumer the advice that, you know, this will be good for your garden because. Right. So what we'll do is we'll we'll ship stuff into the chains that we know customers will be successful with, but it won't be the same kind of mix that you get in, a, right. in an independent And I guess at center. that point, you really have to rely on, uh, on your tagging to do some work for you too. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. So we've got um, information on both sides of the tag. So it's, uh, um, you know, pictures on the front, but, uh, pruning and planting and watering information on the back. So one of the cool things that we do around here is um, we don't use a lot of uh, chemicals, not a lot of pesticides. Um, we use what we call biological control. So it's basically the good bugs fighting the bad bugs. So we, what we do is we introduce insects that are predators that will eat like aphids and thrip and, and uh, even if you're spraying harsh pesticides, you'll always have low levels of bugs. It's just the way it is, because the yep. bugs come in from outside. Um, but with uh, predators, you can tolerate low levels because you know the good bugs will take care of them. So we've gone to a philosophy of um, probably 20 years ago, what we used to do is we just kind of close everything up and try and keep the bugs out. Now we actually leave everything open and let the bugs in. Right. because there's lots of natural predators that if you give them the right environment, they will look after things inside. And all we do is introduce to supplement the natural yeah. predators that are outside. Yeah, and I guess if you try to keep everything out, uh, the fastest breeding ones will win, and those, <laughs> yeah. are, those are the pests. Yeah, you really you end up fighting a losing battle. Right. So it's, um, it's a more progressive way to grow, and there's many growers that are, that are using that approach rather than just hit them with all the all the pesticides and the other fantastic thing about it is it's totally safe for our staff you know so we, we years ago we would do a heavy spray and then we might have to wait two or three days before we could actually go in and work on the crops now because we're introducing biological control and it's it's really just uh the low level of insects that are in here and and no pesticides yeah you know while the guys are doing uh release the beneficials everybody's just working and it's just business as usual. It's a, it's a win for everybody. It is. You're growing a whole ton of hanging baskets up here, which yeah. is kind of a great way to use space. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And you can see, uh, well, these are just, just being finished irrigating. You can see they're, they're dripping. So yeah, it's, it's a matter of getting them all planted on time and then hung up and then onto the automatic irrigation. And then they'll ship just before Mother's Day. Oh, awesome. But they're really happy in here. You can see we don't pack it completely full. Right. And the reason is we want to have enough light, um, you know, for the crops below. Yeah, exactly. Well, that makes a, makes a lot of sense. And yeah, it's drippy in here, but uh, I'm not getting rained on, so. <laughs> yeah. yeah, there's no staff work in here right now. We normally do the irrigation in the mornings, um, and that way it gives the, the plants to dry down in mm -hmm. the afternoon, and then they're not sitting wet overnight. Yeah. And then you have way less disease problems. What we do is we have uh, 15 different zones that we grow one gallon clematis and other vines in and the reason we have the different zones is we have them um, staged so that they're ready to hit markets from the west coast in uh, late February or early March um, right through uh, into uh, the prairies or um, uh, or the Midwest or any of the colder areas that could be as late as uh, mid-May. Okay. And uh, by staging them, what we do is we, we get them ready um, in terms of all leafed out and in some cases budded. And then um, we drop the temperatures. So these, uh, all these uh, greenhouses vent so we can drop the temperatures and hold them right around freezing. 
um, so the plants are nice and hard when they go out so they stand up well in the garden center in the consumer's home as well perfect yeah so and i guess if you're shipping to colder climates you yeah. definitely want that hardiness yeah right? it's a combination of a having the plant ready for retail and b having it ready to stand up in someone's garden so one question that we sometimes get is how the heck do you look after all these plants and um you know of course everything has to be done by hand in the end uh, but we have a lot of tools that, that help us with that. Like we've got, uh, uh, the, it's called a combi track forklift. And you can see this fella here is um, just put down about 200 pots. And um, you know, he's put it down onto a station where they'll get twisted and cut back and, and pegged if necessary. And then they'll get picked up and brought back out into the greenhouse. And uh, you can see that uh, although our crops are grown on the ground for a, for a most part, uh, most of the work is done on the crops where the people are actually standing up. Right. It's, it's not it used to be years ago that everybody would be bending down working on the crops. It's really hard on everybody. So you can see here what we've got. This is called a buffer belt. And um, these particular plants are coming down the line they've been uh, tagged and uh, you can see they've got basically all the foliage inside the, the trellis and then they're going down onto this buffer belt and when we first started growing them whoops When we first started growing them, they were on the ground, they were pot tight so we could get the maximum amount into the greenhouse. And now that we've started shipping some product, we're able to give them a little bit more space. Yeah, so this buffer belt actually spaces them out. You can see a little bit of space between each, each pot. It'll go down here and then it'll be all lined up perfectly for one of the combi tracks to come in, <laughs> pick up the plants drop them back down in the greenhouse in a nice space format. Well, those are so cool. I have to brag. I can lift uh, three pots in each hand. That's so, good. So six at a time, but yeah. Uh, yeah. but not 200 at a time. Yeah. So. <laughs> well, you know what? Six at a time, we, we did that for many, many years. And if a person could do six, they were really doing well. Yeah. So a lot of people pick up two at a time and or one at a time, but a girl like Sue Winder, she's always done three in each hand. But. <laughs> This, this sensor here, I just that's blocked it and that's why I started piling it. Oh, there. yeah, it can be as as much as a cup of coffee sitting down on a buffer belt that can shut down the whole line. It's so, always the sensor. It's yeah, always the sensor. Yeah. So you can see I had to catch that pot over there and, and uh, because it was, everything was going awry because he continued leaving his coffee all over the place. <laughs> So just overview, this header house area that you have here, it, does it double as your shipping area, but you also do some potting here as well? That's correct. Um, we do most of our shipping out of the far end. I think there's eight, eight or nine bays there, you know, where the trucks can come in and, and load. And we do a lot of order assembly and production down at this end. But uh, our shipping area is, is fantastic. We, we made it big enough that it's not just cram and we have gone from literally um, having stuff just absolutely crammed into tiny areas and having to move stuff and and uh, when we built this space here we learned our lesson and we made a huge <laughs> header area where we can we can store stuff we can plant we can stage orders we got lots of room for conveyors and, and it's made a huge difference this this machine here is it's called a, a, an LE machine. It's Danish technology, and um, the size of LE that, that you see here is actually kind of a mid size. We call it a 60 millimeter, and uh, this is used for a liner. So what we'll do is um, we'll we'll take a smaller rooted cutting, and it'll get planted in here. But I'll show you. This is kind of like a sausage maker. Yeah, I was going to say, it's, yeah. got, it's got a liner there, it's got the paper, yeah. cool. and it's pushing soil through. So basically, the soil gets dropped into that bin there. Okay, I'm going to swing around. Here we go. And then it um, goes through here. It gets sucked into here. 
Um, this is a biodegradable paper. So we're not having to use a plastic pot anymore. So, so it goes through here, cuts it up, and then this machine actually loads it into um, a tray and then it'll go down a conveyor into that machine there and it's a little bit hard to see but there's a bunch of drill bits there let me go over there i'll just yeah, uh, sure. yeah. that's a, i guess that's your dibbler yeah yeah it's like a dibbler exactly so it just drills the the holes actually you can see a tray here that's done okay and then actually this got put aside because you can see it wasn't drilled in the center it was a little off center yeah yeah so it drills the center and then when we're going full blast here um we'll actually <laughs> you can't you can just drop the liners into there and we do that do that sometimes but we've got this other machine here which um it'll be going here again in about another month but this is a transplanter and what will happen is those dibbled uh, 60 mil millimeter alley pots will go onto this belt and then you can see there's uh, we call them grippers what they will do is they will literally go into um, a tray of, of small clematis for example it'll pick up the uh, alley pot the, the 30 millimeter alley pot and it'll drop it into a 60 millimeter alley pot so this this will be able to plant probably 50,000 um, 30s to 60s in a day with, with two people max. Wow. Yeah. Okay, well yes. that cuts down to the labor quite a lot. Yeah, it does. And uh, not only that, but um, it, it gives us um, a little bit better precision that you, than you can actually get by hand. Right. Because the holes drilled in the right spot, the, uh, the grippers will drop it in just the right spot. And uh, if it's not right, you have to shut it down and readjust it. And um, it's, it's actually enabled us to have um, some, maybe a little bit higher level labor, a little bit more skilled um, that, that um, are able to use some of their talents to make everything run well. So I mentioned the term liner a little bit earlier. And um, this is our mid-size liner here, which is a 60 millimeter. So we were looking at that uh, alley pot machine and they, they were act, that machine actually makes this size of liner. So you can see, so you can see we had that uh, biodegradable paper <coughs> that holds the soil. Now this whole thing can be planted into a one gallon pot or you could literally plant it right into the ground and uh, there's ju just no transplant shock with this particular product. Uh, it used to be that, uh, and still a lot of growers will just take soil and they'll put it in here, but often when you pull out the liner, the soil will fall out from around the roots and that'll cause transplant, what we call transplant yeah. shock. But this, because of the alley pot, it, it holds everything in place. It prov provides just a great, a great uh, environment for the roots just to thrive. And, uh, you know, having a good liner just makes it that much easier to have a good finished product, which makes it that much easier for the gardener to have something that's not going to die in their garden. And not only that, but it's going to excel in their garden. Yeah. So. And one quick point I'll make on that, uh, the color of the roots on that is a little bit yellowish, which isn't bad for a clematis. Well, clematis have what we call a bootlace root. So um, they're always kind of... Uh, uh, brown in color for the most part but it, when you get down to the very base of the root you want to see white tips right and you they were on there yeah so for sure. you can back it up and check <laughs> <laughs> but they are there and uh, that's a good way to tell that that a plant is healthy whether it's a clematis or, or a geranium or anything um, you don't want to just look at root mass you want to look at the quality of the root and yeah. the quality of the root if the end of the root tips are white, it's a very good, very good sign that the root has continued to develop. And that doesn't mean that if they're not white that you need to be worried. It could be the time of the year when the roots are growing, um, or it could just be something that the plant's going through, and if it's in the garden, it's gonna take care of it itself in, in most cases. If it's in the greenhouse, it might be something we'd wanna look at and figure out why the roots aren't white, and then you know, perhaps you know, do some testing, find out what fungus it is and if it's a fungus and, and then treat for it. But uh, it's all about uh, 
uh, really good water management and, um, makes for good roots, really. I mean, if you run stuff way too wet, that's when you run into root problems typically, which often people say, well, okay, if my plants are outside, how can I control how wet they are? But the thing is, um, it's really when they're growing that you care most. So if it's through the winter or early spring, and the plant really hasn't started to grow and it's running really wet outside, it's not gonna hurt your plants at all because they'll just, the water will just disappear. It's when the plant started to grow and it's sunny outside, that's when you gotta be worried about how much um, water your plants are getting. And more isn't always better. It's, um, you know, you wanna water a plant when it needs to be watered. Basically, you pick up a handful of soil, squeeze it. If you don't get any water drops out, it's fine to water it. If it's uh, full of water, better just to leave it. And uh, it's kinda, I always, when I'm talking to to garden clubs and stuff, I always mention that uh, typically the gardeners that have the most problems are the uh, the gardeners that are most conscientious of their garden. Yes. Which sounds very ironic, but um, a guy like me, I put my plants out in the yard and I, I, I'm not going to say completely forget about them, but I do very little to them, you know, unless we get into hot spell or something. You know, obviously you have to water them in and, and, and take care of them, but Sometimes gardeners actually kind of overdo it. Yep. And there's nothing funner than tending to a garden, in my opinion, anyway. Right. I'm maybe a little limited, but I love to go out there and see, see how stuff's coming along. And But when you're checking your garden, just keep in mind you don't need to water. And you don't need to fertilize all the time. And either. you don't need to fertilize. Yeah. More isn't always better. Yeah. Yeah. So you can kill so, it with kindness. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and that that's really unfortunate. That happens to a lot of very conscientious, actually great gardeners, but they just don't realize that they're just running stuff too wet. Yeah. Yeah. So more liners in this range. Um, and roses. You see, that's yeah, my thing. And roses. That's, that's yeah. my thing. So yeah, yeah. You're the rose expert. <laughs> we we just do. Some, actually, we do a few shrub roses, but mostly climbers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah, um, that kind of themes with the rest of what you sell exactly. here, right? Because you're you're well known. Yeah. For flowering vines. And yes. Yeah. So I mean, clematis uh, within our vines, clematis account for about sixty percent, but the other vines are are super important too. So we do. Um, Achebia, Campsis, which is known as trumpet vine. Uh, we do honeysuckles, uh, Lanistra. Uh, we do jasmines, um, tracheal spurnums, so your star jasmine, and uh, Parthenocissus, which would be your Virginia creepers. And uh, I'm not sure what I'm forgetting, but uh, <laughs> there's a few other obscure ones, like actually Humulus. Yeah. You know, Humulus yeah, is, hops, uh, yeah. that's hops. And, uh, Lots of humus sold in the prairies. They're super hardy, and uh, they've made a resurgence in the last 10 years because there's just so much interest in people doing their own brewing. Right. So are they, they're not buying the ornamental hops per se. These guys are interested in the beer brewing hops. You know, it's, it's both, yeah. it's both. Um, I think the, the uh, uh, surge is, is partly because of the beer brewing, but um, hops are nice in the garden too. I mean, they're vigorous, but they're super hardy. Yeah. And uh, a lot of people just just grow them for an ornamental reason, and they'll they, they will produce hops. And, and somebody can. somebody showed me hop shoots, fresh yeah. hop shoots early in the season. Yeah, are kind of tasty. Yeah, <laughs> I thought that was kind of cool. Yeah. Oh yeah. 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 So these liners, for the most part, will go into gallons next May, and uh, and then we'll sell them the following year in a gallon. So, so. propagation schedule wise, you cut you took cuttings on these. How long ago now for to get them to this size right now? To get now. them to this size, it's just about a year. Um, so we're not actually doing propagation at this range, so I won't show you that today. Yep. But um, yeah, the stock plants are basically grown. Uh, we grow them uh, up to about this height. We cut them yep. down, take cuttings. We start doing that in uh, February. Okay. Yeah. And, and these uh, are about a year old. Yeah. And that's bulked them up into these uh, these L pot liners. Yeah. And next spring, if you throw this into a gallon pot, it'll finish fast. Yeah. Um, you can plant that like in January into a gallon um, and have it finish the same spring. We actually don't do that. We plant them earlier. We actually will do our planting in uh, for the most part in June. Yeah. And then uh, we'll just have a fantastic product the following year. 
And a lot of growers um, will plant them in the summer or even early fall, but then there's a lot that prefer to plant in January because it just fits into their space better. Yeah. You still get an adequate product, but you won't get quite the same root yeah. mass that you will if you plant yeah. it. And, your, and yours go out then really bulky. Really bulky, yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. And like you probably noticed when we were over there that ours are going out on a three foot stake in a one gallon, um, which we like. It's, it's very difficult to ship because, um, let's see, I'll show you a sh shipping pallet because you, you literally have to stack them instead of just, if you're on a, like a 12 inch stake or an 18 inch stake, then you can put them on shelves, on a shelf, yeah. which is really easy, but then it's not as nice for the consumer because you're getting a smaller plant to start with. Yeah. So. We figured out ways to ship them with the three foot stake quite efficiently. Yeah. I want to take a picture of that and see what they look like when they go out the door. So that'll have 200 pots on it. Approximately 200, but actually that one's probably got 250. Just looking at the stack. That, that is a lot of plants. Yeah, and every one will come off looking great. And you stack them with the plants sort of occupying the space between the pots. Exactly, yeah. That's it for the tour and I want to take this time to give a special thanks to Rob Ween for taking the time out of what must have been a very busy week for him to take me around his facility and to let me take you along and uh, tape it. Uh, I really appreciate his insights. That's the part which that I think you can't get anywhere else except by talking to a real expert in their field. What do you do for growing? What do you do for scheduling? What do you do for pest control? Wonderful insights there and I want to thank him a lot. As for you, the audience, thanks for watching. Uh, they do have, Clearview has a retail location and if you ask me nicely in the comments, I will see if I can get twist his arm one more time to take us around and show us their retail location which is an excellent sort of hybrid between the wholesaler and direct to the public retail that I think you would enjoy seeing. All right thanks so much for watching and if you have any questions please drop those down in the comments of the video and I'll see what I can do to help.